Hi, greetings from Lisbon, Portugal. It's really a pleasure to be part of this conference this year. My name is Filipe Roque-Duval and I'm presenting this paper alongside my colleague Manuel Damasio. The paper is called The Abstract Machine, a framework for creative film editing. The first discussions around the thematic of this paper were driven by personal experience in teaching film editing. Both me and Manuel work in a film school and have done so for the past 25 years. I'm also a film editor and I've worked as an editor for two decades. Our goal with this paper is to analyze the creative mechanics of film editing and to integrate them into a framework that relates them with the cinematic experience. We believe this framework can be useful for students, providing them with in-depth knowledge, and for editors, giving them conceptual instruments for the development and for critical analysis. It's important to recognize that in the last 20 to 30 years, cinema went through a lot of contextual transformations. Those transformations were fueled by the digitalization of the whole process, from making a film to the cultural experience of watching it. That changed the way films are made because it changed technologies and equipment, and it requires new techniques and new procedures. It also changed the way films are consumed. Networks, social media, streaming platforms reshaped the way we relate with the cinematic experience. Within this new cultural context, the tools became accessible. Most people have access to smartphones and computers and know how to film and how to edit. This created a new literacy, and the editing techniques are now common knowledge for creative enthusiasts. With this paper, we want to design a framework for this new technological and cultural context, a reframing of existing editing series and techniques. We want to identify important elements in play and to give them a general logic. The first part of this framework deals with the notion of cinematic experience, the experience the viewer goes through when seeing a film. We believe the role of the editor is to design or to shape that experience. He does it by putting images and sound together, so any decision on the editing process will affect the overall cinematic experience. This notion of a cinematic experience will also give us a grid of reference and instruments for critical analysis. Let's start by saying that a cinematic experience is both an emotional experience and an intellectual experience. It's emotional because a film affects our feelings, and it's intellectual because it also contains information. It makes us reflect on what we are seeing. We can break this experience into three concurrent dimensions, the narrative, the aesthetic, and the discursive. The narrative dimension deals with story and the way the story is told. At the narrative dimension, the editor should focus on structure, conflict, events, causality, and characters. The narrative level can be strong both at an emotional and at an intellectual level. The aesthetical dimension deals with images and sound. It's very powerful at an emotional level. It can also be interesting at an intellectual level, but it's mostly emotional. At this dimension, the editor should focus its attention on image, sound, music, time, duration, and rhythm. The discursive dimension deals mainly with the intellectual level. It requires the use of dialectics at, dif at different dimensions. It's about what does, what does the film wants to say, or to question, it's about meaning or lack of meaning. If we look at editing as a design process, the cinematic experience will emerge from that process. We see it as a dynamic system. By changing the setup, by changing how we put images and sound together, we create conditions for the experience to emerge. The graphics displayed on the screen are an example. Below, we have images, shots that contain visual elements. We have sound, probably noise and music and dialogue, and we display them in a certain way to create a set of relations in between them. And we can try to understand how, the, how those elements and the relations they establish are affecting the overall filmic experience. If we can grasp how the system is working, we can try to understand how to affect the experience by altering the conditions. When cutting a film, I would try to understand how each decision will impact the experience at all three dimensions. And I would ask the students to do the same, because at least they will have a better knowledge of the material they are using and on the film they are working in. This gives us a frame of reference, an analytical tool, something to confront our decisions and to understand them better. The next part of our framework implies the identification of core elements of the process. For us, those are filmic elements and relations. Elements are the images and sounds. They are concrete. We can see them or hear them. We can identify properties, qualities, characteristics. They define a space of possible relations in between them. The role of the editor is to set up to activate some of those relations. Some might be elusive or just depend on the viewer. 
Relations are not concrete, they are abstract. They depend on factors defined by the concrete elements, but they are not concrete. They live in multiple dimensions affected by information, intensity, time, or rhythm. When we learn editing, we learn techniques to put shots together, and we get used to do it in a certain way. Nowadays, that certain way includes a lot of freedom, but it's still somehow restricting the possibilities at the creative level. If we consider editing to consist of film elements and relations, this certain way is already guiding us on how to put those elements together, and by doing so, restrict restricting the space of possibilities defined by the filmic elements. So the next step, focus on what type of processes can be involved when dealing with parts and relations. And we want to look at it as an open frame, without any restrictions, except the ones defined by the concrete elements themselves. To identify how the dynamics between parts and relations work, we are using the assemblage theory. The assemblage theory was initially developed by Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari in the book 1000 Plateaus. Deleuze and Guattari created this theory as an opposition to the Hegelian philosophy of totalities. The notion that a concept can integrate a set of things that have humanalities, like the word man. Under that word, all men are men, or a nation. That would include all nations under its definition. So if we define Western society as a nation that has democracy, a set of rules, a set of institutions, the rule of law, we can easily find several nations that can fit that definition. So we might be able to go to another country, let's say Afghanistan, and implement there a Western society if we apply those same conditions there. The assemblage theory looks at phenomena in a different way. It's all defined by components and relations. So even if we apply the same conditions in Afghanistan, because the parts have different properties, the relations they establish between themselves are quite different, and so the result that emerges might be uh, also very different. We use this theory because it fits our requirements, in the sense that we define film editing as a process that involves concrete elements and relations. The problem with the 1000 plateaus is that the and Gotari, although extensively using this approach, they never really explains what the assemblage theory is. They don't make a systemization of the theory. Deleuze says in an interview that it works more like a general logic. So we are using the work of Manuel de Lende, namely in the book A New Philosophy of Society. De Lende tries to systemize a theory of assemblage based on the writings of Deleuze and Gattari with a couple of its own adaptations. For de Lende, an assemblage is a whole that results from part and relations. So it has a part to whole relationship. But the properties of the assemblage are only present in the whole. Only when there are parts and relations. In this sense, it's not reducible to the parts, but it can be decomposed, and it displays emergent properties. And it's scalable, and that's an important characteristic. It means it works at different levels. If you talk about a local market, where one can buy meat or fish or vegetables, and we think of it as an assemblage, we can identify or decompose it into different component parts, the products, the stands, the building, the tools, the people working, the clients, the suppliers. When activated, it creates a relation in between, in between these component parts. The result is an assemblage that we can call local market. But that market does not explain the local economy. So to understand the local economy, the market as a whole becomes a component part of a bigger assemblage that relates to all component parts in that economy. The same thing happens in film editing. We can be working in a scene, and the result is the assemblage, scene. But then the scene might become part of a sequence, in which in turn it might become a component part of an act, and so on. So this ability to scale back and forth is very useful. There are three characteristics that all assemblages share. They all have agents, they all have concrete elements, and they all have an abstract machine. The agents are what set the assemblage into motion, what activates the assemblage. In editing, the agents are who is creating the assemblage and the viewer that activates it. The concrete elements are the filmic elements, images and sounds. The abstract machine is a space of possible relations determined by the concrete elements, so it's a space of possibilities in which the only limitations are defined by the concrete elements themselves. They define the limits of possible connections, and at the same time they open themselves to innumerable possible combinations. In film editing, the abstract machine is the space for creativity, is the space that the editor inhabits. This means that the rules are only established by the filmic elements in play. 
Using the assemblage theory, we can also identify the main processes of connecting component parts, and in doing so, what sort of relations can be established. We can identify them over two different dimensions or two different axes. One dimension, or axis, defines the variable roles which an assemblage component may play, from a purely material role at one extreme of the axis to a purely expressive role at the other extreme. These roles are variable and may occur in mixtures, that is, a given component may play a mixture of material and expressive roles by exercising a different set of capacities. Let's think of a conversation between two persons. We can frame it as the assemblage conversation between two persons. It can have the following component parts, two persons, a table, two chairs, probably a coffee or a beer and a glass of water. The words that are used, the expressions, are also part of the dynamics of the assemblage. So if one person says, I don't like red, that's material information, but it doesn't come alone. That is also the tone of the voice, the intonation, the body language. Those are expressive elements. They, may, they might not say something in concrete, but they are relevant to create meaning and for the overall sense of the experience. In editing, this means that depending on the setup of filmic elements and the network of relations that emerge from that setup, different qualities and different characteristics of those filmic elements are activated. They can become meaningful for the design of the cinematic experience. Some of those roles convey material information, that is, information that is concrete, is there for effect, like a line of dialogue or a decisive action from a character. That type of information is crucial for the narrative dimension of the experience. At the same time, the editor looks for other things to emerge from that assemblage, and those are equally relevant. They define the expressive values of the experience. They affect meaning, but also emotions. To understand the other dimension, or axis, we need to differentiate two types of assemblage, one characterized by relations of interiority, and the other characterized by relations of exteriority. In an assemblage characterized by relations of interiority, the component parts are constituted by the very relations they have to other parts in the whole. A part detached from such whole ceases to be what it is, since being this particular part is one of its constitutive properties. In this type of assemblage, the part's quality and what they are is one and the same. In this sense, it's very difficult to detach a part from the assemblage because it would cease to, to be what it is. This type of assemblage tends to have very defined borders and they constitute organic relations. Our own body is an assemblage of this type. It has clear borders, defined by our skin, separating the inside and the outside, and the parts are fused together in an organic way. If we take a part out, let's say a finger, it becomes worthless, it has no function. Being a finger is being part of a hand, and being a hand is, is being part of an organic body. On the other extreme of the axis, in an assemblage characterized by relations of exteriority, being a part of a whole involves the exercise of a part's capacity, but it's not a constitutive property of it. And given that an exercised capacity does not affect what a component is, a part may be detached from the whole while preserving its identity. These relations imply, first of all, that a, that a component part of an assemblage may be detached from it and plugged into a different assemblage, in which its interactions are different. Think of the ecosystem of a garden. It might have grass, flowers, bushes, insects, bees, some benches, a kid's playground, people. The dynamic of the garden means that these component parts create relations in between them. For instance, a flower it makes the garden more beautiful, and so it relates to the people there. It also gives pollen to the bees, that in turn will pollinize other parts of the garden, thus making it a dynamic system. Within that assemblage, the flower is still a flower. Some of the flower attributes are meaningful in that ecosystem, some other might not be so meaningful there. If I take a flower from the garden, and take it to my house and put it in a vase, it becomes part of the assemblage my house, and it's still a flower. Within the assemblage my house, the attributes that emerge are different from the ones emerging from the assemblage garden. So if we go back to our axis, we have the interiority in one extreme and the exteriority on the other. This means that some assemblages are somewhere in the middle. There are different gradients of interiority or exteriority. So this dimension defines variable processes in which the components become involved, 
and it either stabilized the identity of the assemblage by increasing its degree of internal homogeneity or the degree of sharpness of its borders, or destabilize it. The former are referred to as process of territorialization, and the later as process of deterritorialization. A process of territorialization increases the degree of internal homogeneity and the degree of sharpness of its borders. In film editing, this would mean to fuse the filmic elements together in a way that they would become an organic body. The visual flow, the continuous movement, becomes more meaningful than the individual shots. One example of a process of territorialization is continuity editing techniques. The territorialization, on the other hand, would be processes that allow the usage of filmic elements out of the continuous flow. Some images or sound have more potential for the territorialization in the sense that they have values or qualities that can emerge out of continuity. They are easy to detach from one assemblage and to integrate in a new one, in which some of its qualities may emerge in a different way, or to provide different meaning or emotions. A process of deterritorialization may result on borders that are more blurred, like seams that are mixed or interwined. They replace organicity by meaningful connections on filmic elements that are somehow individualized, in which the material or expressive values stand out to produce meaning. Pudovkin techniques like contrast, parallelism or symbolism, as well as Eisenstein's intellectual montage, can be viewed as process of deterritorialization. In the last part of our framework, we look at coding. In assemblage theory, these two specialized expressive media are viewed as the basis for a second synthetic process. The coding, performed by genes or words, supplies a second articulation, consolidating the effects of the first, and further stabilizing the identity of the assemblage. Genes provide coding for, our, for how our cells evolve and replicate. Any assemblage has specific codes that keeps it stable. If you look at a typical classroom, let's say in a university, there are specific rules for the students and for the teacher. Those rules are implicit to the assemblage classroom. The adherence to those rules keeps the classroom assemblage stable. So coding is very relevant. In film editing, coding means using editing techniques, some more classic, some more contemporary, some still to be created. Classic continuity editing is a coding method. It provides rules known by the editor and understood by the audience. Post-classical editing, with its elliptical cuts and faster pacing, became a new coding method. We can find coding methods on music videos commercial, in Podovkin, in Eisenstein or in YouTube. They keep evolving and creating new literacies. Typically, these coding methods are the focus of theorization. So we don't define what is good or bad, what is new or old. It really depends on factors defined by a proposed cinematic experience and an abstract machine. In this framework, editing a film is dwelling into an abstract machine. A tension between given filmic elements and an idea of a cinematic experience. Within the abstract machine, the editor shapes relations between filmic elements. Some of those allow the emergence of material information. Some are more expressive. The process sometimes involves territorializing fusing the filmic elements together, creating a flow of action or movement, other times deterritorializing, isolating and bringing, bringing meaning from the established relations. In doing so, we can resort to coding procedures, using techniques that are known to editors and filmmakers, and we keep confronting this dynamic system with the three dimensions of the cinematic experience, trying to understand how they are affecting it. So I'd like to thank you all for watching this presentation and I think I will be available for, for questions and for further discussion. Thank you very much.